All right, so we are in 2 Timothy this morning. 2 Timothy. And today's title is called A Dedicated Life. A Dedicated Life. So let's read together. It says this, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know that all those in Asia who have turned away from me among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes, the Lord grant mercy to the household of Oniphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find from the Lord in that day, that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day, excuse me, and you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. So, Father in heaven, we thank you again for this word. May I step into the background. May your Holy Spirit take over and encourage all of us in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen, amen and amen. A dedicated life. So the first thing Paul writes to Timothy is to hold fast. To hold fast the pattern of sound words. One source that I found hold fast has nautical origins. For sailors, when they were instructed to hold fast during a storm, meaning to hold tight, hang on, secure the ropes and the rigging. By not holding tight, not holding fast, they would be tossed into the sea in the middle of a storm, which would not end well. To hold fast is an active action. It's something a person must participate in. You can believe in the theory of holding fast during a storm, you can believe that you should be holding fast and that it's a good thing, but if you actually don't do it, you're in trouble. Any roller coaster riders here? A few? Some of you are like in the hands in the air, I just don't care. Yeah. Uh, some of you hold on for dear life because you don't want to fly off the coaster. And some of you are smart and you stay on the ground. <laughs> Not that the others aren't, but they're more daring. My wife and I have been riding coasters for 39 years. The last one we went on a couple months ago. She declared it was her last one, and I did not argue with her. <laughs> Something happens, I don't know. Paul writes to Timothy to hold fast to the pattern of sound words. The pattern. A pattern is something that repeats and is, pre and is predictable. A pattern is repeated in a regular way in which something happens or is done. A pattern is not holding fast occasionally. I'll hold fast in some of the storms. No, that doesn't work. We must hold fast in all the storms. Failure to do one time can end in destruction. Paul is urging young Timothy to hold fast to the pattern every time there is a storm. In this context, is being consistent in the words that are spoken and written by Paul, to, to hold fast to the pattern of those sound words. And when he says sound words, it's not like an audio noise. It's words that are words that are solid, firm, stable, secure, reliable, free from error or fallacy. Paul is urging Timothy to hold fast, hang on to the repeated and predictable words that he has heard from him. In the context for today, to hold fast to the pattern of sound words is to continue to believe or adhere to an idea or principle to stay the course, to firmly remain in the same position, to keep the same opinion of the words that you have heard. And these words, of course, that we're talking about are the word of God. To hold fast to them. What do we know about the word of God? The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever, Amen. forever. God's word is not a catchphrase like, or a bumper sticker or a fad. It's not like the phrase cool or rad or groovy or boss or hip. Some of you relate to those and some of you are like, what? <laughs> These phrases were, are what were popular in a season in our culture and eventually everything in the culture gets lost or unfortunately gets recycled sometimes, like bell bottoms. I don't know. Sorry. 
The bands I used to follow decades ago, I can see young people wearing the same t-shirts I used to wear, and they think they've discovered something new. <laughs> How cool I thought I was back then, and no, I was not. I've yet to be cool. Sorry. I smirk because there's nothing new under the sun. What's really sad is sometimes those bands get recycled two or three or four times, and I go, oh, how old I've gotten. <laughs> God's word is not a fad. It, it's not something cool. It's not something rad. It is awesome, but that word can fail too. It gets used and overused sometimes. God's word is eternal. It lasts forever. God's word is inerrant. There are no mistakes. There are no fallacies. There are no mistakes at all. It does not contradict itself. If we think it contradicts itself, which I've thought in past years, it's because I lack understanding of what it's saying. And once I studied up, eventually God reveals, oh, here's your error, knucklehead. Okay, okay, good, there it is. Your word is still true. God's word is holy. It is to be received. It is precious. It's to be trusted. God's word shows us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Everything you need to know is in there. It shows us how to live correctly before him. Amen. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God spoke it into existence. Man was privileged to write it down, just like he spoke the planets into existence. It shows us what to believe. It convicts us. It shows us how to correct ourselves. Shows us how to walk rightly in front of God the Father. It trains us up so that we might be of service to Him. God's Word isn't there just to feel good. It's there to train us up that we would be service to Him and to the, to the world. When we adhere to His Word, we become more godly. It's that simple. When we reject, discard, or deny His Word, we become more disillusioned, distracted, discontent, depressed, and despondent. We've all been there probably. When we get away from his word, we're like, what's going on? The sky is falling. No, God is still in control. Uh, this week was the uh, elections. And know this much, it, regardless of who you voted for, Christ is still king and he's still on the throne. Amen. The elections for four years for the president uh, Christ is on the throne forever. So whatever energy you put into the election, please put it into the Lord instead this time. <laughs> Paul writes, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me. So a question is, what were these sound words that Paul shared with Timothy? We've been through the first book of Timothy. We just started the second book of Timothy. I'm going to go over some verses fairly quickly to remind us of the things we've seen in first and second Timothy so far. And if you've not been, if you weren't there for the uh, sermons from Pastor Henry or Pastor Jim, you can go to YouTube, type in Calvary Chapel, Beaumont, California. You can see our channel. You can watch all those things again. If you need help, we'll help you. But here, here are those verses, some of them. There's too many to choose from. But as you listen to these verses, apply them to yourself and see if you are pursuing them properly. We need to pursue them properly. 1 Timothy 1.5, love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. How's your heart? How's your trust in God's word? Do you trust it completely? Is your faith sincere? Are you playing church? It's for all of us to think about, me included. Uh, chapter 1, verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am one of. Praise the Lord. Amen. 
chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, for this is a good and acceptable in sight of our God and Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's heart. He's not there hoping to throw people into hell. People are headed to hell. And God wants to rescue them one by one by one. That's his heart. Chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and all men, the man Christ Jesus. There's not multiple roads to heaven. Jesus and him alone. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He's the door. He's the sheep gate. He's all these great things. He's the bread of life. All these symbolic examples of who he is. It's Jesus Christ and him alone. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed in the world, and received up in glory. There's Jesus' existence on earth right there in a verse. If you can, turn to Luke 24. Luke 24. It's to your left. Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's the third book of the New Testament. Talking about all these great verses that we need to apply to ourselves, things we've seen so far in First Timothy, some of the th things we've seen. Give me an amen when you're there. Amen. In Luke 24, Jesus has just risen from the dead. He's walking along the road to Emmaus. And these two guys are walking along the road, and he joins them. Now, behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. That's a long walk. And they talked together all of the things that had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. Here's Jesus walking, but then you don't recognize him. And Jesus said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Not that he didn't know the answer already. He was starting up a conversation with them. Then the one whose name was Cleophas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? As if he didn't know. So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it, that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today in the third day since the things have happened, little did they know he is going to redeem Israel one day. Amen. And anyone who believes. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but him they did not see. <coughs> then he said to them, O foolish ones, O slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. He's correcting them. Ought not the Christ to have to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? In verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's the best Bible study ever. Amen. Then they drew near the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened... And they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And my point so far is verse 32. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us when he talked, about, when he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Did not our heart burn inside of us when we heard the scriptures? When I'm reading these other scriptures, is your heart not burning for those scriptures and the things that they say and the life that they give? Wake up if it's not. This is life. The scriptures are perfect. And we need to live by them. Amen? Amen. Amen.
and amen. Moving on, what were some of these sound words we've heard so far in First and Second Timothy? Chapter 4, verse 12 says, Be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Look at all those examples that we're to set for others. How's our example going for others? If we want people to come to Christ, we should show them what it means to walk in Him. So turn off the remote. Open up the Word. Stop scrolling. What's that phrase? Doom scrolling. Ooh. I wish I could get those hours back. Chapter 4, verse 13. Do not neglect the gift that is in you. We've all been given a gift and we're to stir it up. We're to walk in it, whatever it is. And if you don't know what yours is, come talk to us and we'll help you discover it. We want to train up people so they're serving the Lord our God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength that they're fulfilling their purpose in life on this planet. (coughs) Chapter 6, verse 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. It's walking in Jesus and not feeling guilty about anything. It's like, man, we can just walk today, today, Jesus. We can just bless people today, Jesus. Show me who I can bless. Chapter 6, verse 11, Pursue righteousness. Godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Pursue it. It's not just going to happen. You've got to work at it. You've got to dedicate yourself to it. And I'm talking to myself as well. 2 Timothy 1.7, Pastor Jim spoke on last week, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We get those things as we examine the scripture and pray for them. Paul is exhorting Timothy to hold fast, to keep believing upon these and other sound words that he has spoken and written. Paul is saying, stick to the faith in Christ, in Christ Jesus. Don't abandon it. Don't neglect it. Don't take it for granted. Pursue it with all of your being. This is life. So point number one, I won't, don't want to shock you. Hold fast to God's word. Hold fast to God's word. It's got to be simple so I can understand it. Some people, I'm sure you've met them, they talk about Jesus, they think about Jesus, they pray to Jesus, they serve Jesus, they go out of their way to share Jesus, they look forward to the next time they come worship Jesus, and they're a little bit out there and a little bit crazy, but they're so blessed and they're so excited about Jesus. These folks are radical. Some might call them Jesus freaks, but that's a fad word, so I can't use it. These folks are holding fast to the pattern of sound words that they have heard. They heard the words and responded to fulfill what Paul has said about Jesus and what Jesus has said about everlasting life. They're radical. You know them, they're kind of different than the average Joe. They're on one end of the spectrum. And then there's the other end of the spectrum for those who believe. For others, church is optional. I'll go if my team's not playing. Reading is optional. There's a lot to watch. I've got to take care of the yard, you know. Talking about Jesus is optional. I don't want to make someone feel uncomfortable. They might look down on me. Amen. Worship is optional. When are they going to play the songs I like? We get letters like that. Where's the ones I like? Oh, I'm sorry. We're doing what honors God. Serving for these folks is optional. I worked a full week and I'm tired. Or I worked a lifetime and I'm retired. (laughs) Show me retirement in the Bible. My retirement, I have my plan. It's all planned out. Very planned out. It's the rapture or redemption. So whichever one happens first, that's the retirement. Whenever he takes me, he takes me. How about you? Yes, you. Yes. There's some cringing going on. I get it. Where do you stand with holding fast to these sound words? Do you seek, inquire, observe, participate in the things of God, and not just occasionally, continually? 
Doing things for the Lord is not a holiday. It's a daily thing. Amen. Or is God merely optional for some when he's convenient for your lifestyle? Where do you stand on that spectrum, convenience or radical? And there's times we flow both ways, is it not? Sometimes we're all on fire, and sometimes we kind of drift a little bit. Oh, we got to get back over here. Turn to John 14, if you could. John 14. Verse 19. Give me an amen when you get there. Amen. John 14, 19, starting there. Jesus speaking here, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So if you're keeping it, it's evidence that you love him. Verse 22, And Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. According to these verses, when you keep his commandments and his word, you love him. And if you don't, you don't. Ooh. Know this, family. What your spouse does with Jesus, what your neighbor does with Jesus, what your coworker does with Jesus, does not matter to you in the sense of your attitude, faith, and belief in Jesus. What they decide to do is not on you. You can encourage them towards Christ. How they behave does not matter. What they follow does not matter. But they're not to be used as an excuse as to why you didn't hold fast to Jesus in the Word. Amen. It's on you. What matters is what you do with His Word. That's what matters. And if you're holding fast to his word, you're going to affect your spouse and your neighbor and your coworker and all those folks for the gospel's sake. So what are you doing with his word? We must cling to his word and follow through in the understanding of his word. Why? So that we're not flung off into the world like off a roller coaster. If we're not holding tight. How do we do this? Well, it all starts with his word, of course. Psalm 119.11, your word I have hidden in my heart. I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. A life that is disciplined to reading, memorizing, meditating, and praying over God's word is what we all need, not just today or once in a while, but continually. Amen. By continually digging into the scriptures, our hearts will be stirred up to desire the scriptures more and more, and soon it will be a passion to continually return to those scriptures and be stirred up again and again and again. And then we'll be calling you a Jesus freak. No, sorry. No. Amen. Point one was hold fast to God's word. Point number two, dedicate your life to Jesus. Straightforward. Dedicate your life to Jesus. Amen. Verse 14 from uh, 2 Timothy. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Paul writing to Timothy. The church in Ephesus was committed to Timothy, but Paul is exhorting him to keep the good thing that was committed to him. What was committed to Timothy? Besides the church, the gospel, God's truth, the truth of the word, the truth about salvation, the truth about eternal life. And what is that truth? This is from John 17. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So a question for all of us here and outside and online, do you know him? Do you know him? Not about him, not facts and figures, not the history of him, not the theory of him, 
but do you know him? I met my wife in high school 39 years ago. It's amazing because she's 25. (laughs) Her name's Lori. If you gave me a fact sheet about her, I would have read her height, her weight, her eye color, her hair color, her likes, her dislikes, her birth date, her parents' names, her siblings, her schooling, all that good stuff. I would have known the facts about her. I would have known about her factually speaking. But knowing her, seeing her face, hearing her voice, seeing her quirks, understanding her heart to a point (laughs) is much different than a fact sheet about her. Compare that to Jesus. Hearing about Jesus and seeing the thing he did in his word is great and we need it. But we also need to know him and grow in him. Not just the facts about him. Do you know him? And if so, point two again, dedicate your life to Jesus. This good message has been committed to Timothy. He was to carry out his responsibility, his privilege of ministering the gospel in Ephesus. People who have held fast to the scriptures are those who have dedicated themselves to search the scriptures. The result is they are being changed and transformed. If you're the same you are today as you were five or ten years ago, search the scriptures. Call upon the name of the Lord. Ask him to fill you and grow you. We should not be the same. We should be growing, family. Those that are dedicated to Jesus live a dedicated life for Jesus because it's so simple. He dedicated himself to go to that cross for us. How should we not dedicate our lives to him? How can we not do that? What response should we have other than dedicating our lives to him? There is no other response. That's the only reasonable one. The only reasonable one. Life is but a vapor, the Bible says. It's here and it's gone. It's fragile. No day is promised to any of us just because we woke up today doesn't mean we'll wake up tomorrow. I have lived 20,800 and now 17 days. I'll do the math. I'll be 57 soon. And just because I woke up all those days doesn't guarantee me I'll wake up tomorrow. In fact, the higher that number gets, the less likely it is I'll wake up tomorrow. I don't know about you, that's how math works. The day will come when I won't wake up, at least here. But I have a great expectation of waking up in heaven one day. Then I will just exist with the Lord, with a multitude of every tribe, tongue, and nation in heaven, worshiping God. That is my great expectation. So don't cling to this world so hard, family. Hold fast to Jesus. I'm so fortunate that in 1997, the gospel was explained to me. I received him. He has motivated me, inspired me to dedicate my life to him. But not every day has been completely dedicated to him. I have a multitude of failures, which makes me human. It's not like I've arrived. I never will. But I never expected to be looking so forward to the day he takes me home. Because then it's all heaven. The commitment that is in me is not from me. It's not like I could manufacture it. I couldn't just make it up and know I'm going to commit myself. He's placed it in me. And I ask, why me? And the answer is simple. I don't have a clue. (laughs) I'm as unworthy as anybody else. All glory to God. And so if we lack commitment, if we lack growth, if we lack anything, we just pray, Lord. Help me to be hungry for your word. Help me to commit myself better to you. Show me how to walk in you. And as you hold fast to these things, you'll be more stirred up to do just that. The only way to keep what is committed to to Timothy was by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the same goes for us. You want that fire and that passion in you? Cry out on a daily basis to him to fill you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he will not deny you. You'll be filled. It's not like, Lord, fill me with your spirit so I can glorify you. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. No, quite the opposite. Yes, I will. Acts 1.8 says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the end of the earth. Luke 11 says this, so I ask you, 
So I say to you, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. To him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from a father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, and here's the the big point, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Are you asking? Verse 15 from 2 Timothy chapter 1. This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Phygelus reminds me of a bacteria (laughs) and Hermogenes a gallon of milk. I don't know. But my interpretation could be wrong. These two have turned away from Paul. Remember, Paul is in prison. Later, he will state that he's being poured out like a drink offering. His life is being spent on the things of the Lord. His day of going to heaven is nearing, and he knows it. He's been so committed to the word of God and dedicated to the mission put before him that he is spent, worn down, nearing the end. But it's really the beginning, the beginning of eternity for Paul, and he knows it. Paul is cautioning Timothy to hold fast to what was committed to him, and he gives Timothy the example of those who did not, did not hold fast to what was precious. Phygelus and Hermogenes abandoned Paul in his hour of need. They did not persevere through these fiery trials that Paul was enduring. They became weak or sidetracked or fearful. They lost heart. They looked at the physical and forgot about the spiritual. We don't know exactly why, but that's what we can assume. Had they held fast to the gospel and to Christ, they wouldn't have abandoned Paul. Galatians 6, 9 says this. This is Paul who wrote to the church in Galatia. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we, what? Do not lose heart. Life gets disheartening at times, does it not? And when that happens, what are we supposed to do? Go back to Jesus. I'm so sad right now. Help me. Fill me with your spirit. Show me how to walk. I'm in a place of desperation, but I know you're there for me. So a question for us, what happens to someone who doesn't commit themselves to the Lord? What happens to that person? This week it's Jesus, next week it's Buddha, the following week it's reincarnation, the next week it's Mormonism. It's like a fad. Someone who changes their belief system so easily is someone who is never really part of the faith, never really a follower of Christ. They were turned away so easily. They merely came temporarily to Jesus, the thought of Jesus, the benefit of being around Jesus-loving people. Maybe they had goosebumps or a mountaintop experience, but they were not truly committed to him. They may have based their faith in feelings and not facts. Their faith in Christ was a fad, temporary. It was, not cool. It was cool for that moment. And then they saw something else that drew them away. I hate to do this to you, but turn to Deuteronomy, (laughs) chapter 13. It's the fifth book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, chapter 13. You can give me an amen when you get there. Deuteronomy 13, verse 1, verse 1. It says this, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign or wonder comes to pass on which he spoke to you saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them. So there's someone trying to draw people away to other gods. Verse three, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. It's a test to see if you really love him. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. There's that hold fast part again. Cling to him, family. Don't let your God be sports. 
or media or TV or soap operas or hiking. Some of those things are cool, but they're a fad. They're fun to do, some of them. Not all. But hold fast to him. Amen. Recreational things are fine, but don't let them take the place of him. Verse 5, but that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you away from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. You shall put that evil from, you shall put away the evil from your midst. It was so serious there to kill that person because they're going to draw you into oblivion. That's who we follow is the Lord our God. And the question for us, so what has been committed to you? Timothy, he had the church, he had the gospel. What's committed to us as followers of Christ? Surprise, the gospel. Same thing. The Great Commission from Matthew 24 says this, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me under heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The Great Commission was entrusted to the 11 disciples who passed it on to the next generation of those who would believe. And they passed it to the next and the next and the next. How do we know this? Because it reached us. If the Lord tarries, we are entrusted to pass this great commission to the next generation. You know, the Calvary movement would say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, right? It's a cool phrase, but he may not come in our lifetime. So the next generation needs to be ready. The days are evil and wicked, are they not? The young people need Jesus. We are to be busy about our father's business, are we not, family? We are to make disciples, to baptize, to teach them to observe everything Jesus has said to us. In order to make someone a disciple, there's a prerequisite, is that they need to be a believer in him, which in turn requires the gospel, the good news. Amen? Amen. Good. I'm glad you're agreeing. <laughs> what is that good news? Jesus came, died, paid for our sins, rose again, ascended to heaven. He paid a price we could not pay because we can't live a perfect life. We were destined for hell, but God, by his grace, sent his son to take our place. We're to hold fast to the gospel, the good news. As a father, as a proud papa, showing people pictures, photographs of my babies. As a grandpa now, I use my phone, and I want to share the good news of that bundle of joy who now walks and tires me out crazily. <laughs> and it's good news, because she's perfect. And when there's good news, we want to share that good news with others, do we not? If the gospel is good news, we should be excited to share it. Amen. I'm going to give you a few statistics, stats about Christians sharing their faith. About half of Christians say they're prepared and willing to share the gospel. Half. 42% say that sharing their faith with a non-believer is scary. In 1993, 89% of Christians who shared their faith agree that every Christian has the responsibility to do so. So 89% said, yes, we're supposed to. Today, only 64% agree. This one makes me sad. Evangelical Christians, only about 5% of evangelical Christians share their faith directly. I think that's from Barna. If the news is good, should we not share it? Here's my grandbaby. Here's the good news about Jesus. We're to hold fast to the gospel. We're to dedicate our lives to Jesus. A hard question is, when was the last time you shared Christ with someone? When was the last time you shared Christ with someone? Maybe you just don't know how. I was privileged to go to Israel about a year and a half ago at several Historic places we visited, there were Roman, the Romans built roads, aqueducts, bridges, amphitheaters, 
we got to walk on the very roads way that were built way back in Jesus' day by the Romans. Here's a few photos. There's one. That's a road that's 2,000 years old, basically. And next, some ruins and some roads. And next, these things last to millennia. There used to be more, but people would you know, scavenge them and take them apart and build houses and stuff. But you see these roads are strong and fortified and usable in some places currently, 2,000 years later. To put that into context, we have Brookside up here that when a drop of water gets on it, <laughs> it creates a pothole and they've got to fix it every year. And we're more advanced. A Roman's road is known to last, be strong and endurable. But biblically speaking, I like the Roman's road. The Roman's road is in the Bible. It's from the book of Romans. These are Bible verses that lead a person to pray a prayer of salvation. Whenever I get a new Bible, I like to underline those verses first thing. I highlight them, underline them. I have them on my phone. I do this with the anticipation that one day I'll get to open these scriptures up and walk someone down that road to salvation. And it's not me saving them. It's just me, this is what God says, and then the hope is they respond to it. So write these down. We're going to go through them quickly, and we'll give them to you later if you need them. Highlight them, make them, put them on your phone, whatever it is, with the anticipation you're going to walk somebody down that road one day. Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all a bunch of sinners. We don't compare to him. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. He knew what we'd be about and he went to the cross anyway. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's go home. <laughs> we deserve death, and he gives us life in Jesus. Amen. Romans 10.9, here's part of the prayer we're going to pray later, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I say that every time we preach. Because we want people to be saved. Romans 10.13, Whoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you can walk someone through that if you have five minutes. You can explain it a little bit. And then the big punctuation at the end is this. Would you like to receive Jesus today? Let's pray. This is what we call the Romans road biblically. But this road never fails. People can't pick it apart. This message is always correct and these words last forever not just stone it's life there's a simpler version to salvation um, jesus came he died to pay for our sins so we could go to heaven and be with him forever would you like to receive him today the abridged version depending on how much time you have with somebody if you are prepared to share jesus with someone odds are god will bring them in front of you somehow you might pop a tire and be annoyed, and it's that AAA guy that needs Jesus is changing your tire. It could be the next-door neighbor, the cashier who's having a bad day. It could be your spouse, your children, or your grandchildren. Imagine leading your grandkid to Christ. I can't wait. <laughs> We're already reading stuff about Jesus to her, which is awesome. If you hold fast to God's word and dedicate your life to Jesus, he's not going to deny you the privilege of leading somebody to Christ Amen. or somebodies. Like, that's scary. So, you just open la boca. <laughs> this is what God says is salvation. Would you like to receive Jesus today? When holding fast and get dedicating yourself to the things of God, you are looking for opportunities to be used by God to present the gospel to someone who needs Jesus. It's like you're going to AutoZone, and it's not about the oil. It's about who am I going to share Jesus with this time. Now, if you'd like to learn more about sharing your faith, we please fill out a prayer card with your name. Hey, I want to learn how to share Jesus. Drop it in the box. We have people who will train you to share Jesus simply. They'll contact you. We'll get you going. 
Verse 16, back in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 16. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Oniphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. Oniphorus, there's nothing else written about him in the Bible other than this and then a greeting to him later in 2 Timothy. We don't know anything else about him. Had Paul not written about him here, we would not even know about his existence. These verses, though, tell us a lot about this guy. First of all, he went out of his way to find Paul while those in Asia abandoned him, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. We know that he's a faithful servant. We know that he refreshed Paul even when he was in prison. He had a heart for ministry. He was not ashamed of Paul who was in a dire situation. He was focused on the things of the Lord and on the circumstances that Paul was in. Point number three, be focused on the things of the Lord. What he did in ministering to Paul in order to do that, he must have been holding fast to the gospel. He must have dedicated his life to Jesus. And he must have been focused on the things of the Lord. He's quite the example for us, and he's barely written about. Know this about holding fast and dedicating your life to Jesus. Not everything you do will be noticed by others on this planet. Good. But God notices. And I don't know where everybody's at with Christ right now. Get right with Christ right now. Amen? amen and amen. This is from Hebrews 11. But without faith, as the worship team comes up, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So please, diligently seek him. And a few take-home points today. I'm not going to surprise you. The first one is hold fast to God's word. I think we heard that earlier. Dedicate your life to Jesus. Oh, you got me. And be focused on the things of the Lord. Amen? amen. And amen. And Galatians again says, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Amen? amen. We're going to pray. It may be an extended prayer but that's okay. If you don't know Christ, this is your opportunity to come to faith in Jesus right now, whether you're here or online. And if you've been away from Christ, it's your opportunity to rededicate yourself to him right now. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So let us pray, family. So if you want to receive Jesus right now, we've gone through the Romans road. You heard it. You saw it. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And today is that moment. And I don't know who you are, but you know who you are and you know where you stand. But let's pray. So, Father in heaven, I confess right now that Jesus, you are my Lord. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe in my heart that, Jesus, you were raised from the dead on the third day, that you had gone to the cross for my sin, that I might be forgiven. I ask you to save me today, to fill me with your spirit, that I be a follower of yours. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, for the church family, Father, for those who have drifted from you, may they return to you. For those who are on fire for you, may they be encouraging others to do just that, to seek after you, to know you and know you well. Father, forgive us in the times that we're lazy or distracted, the times that we forget about you. We're so grateful for your word and for this day, for the reminder of, of why you came and what you've done. We praise you today because you're worthy of all of our praise. Thank you for this time together as a church body. May you be glorified 
through our lives. Help us to be dedicated to the mission you put before us. We love you. We praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen. and amen. And-